Hello, welcome, hola and bienvenidos everyone. I wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Dr. Eric Rudesky and I serve as the Director of Government Affairs at Hostos Community College. And I'm one of your co-moderators for today's event. And good afternoon, my name is Peter Mertens. I'm the Interim Dean of the Division of Continuing Education and Workforce Development here at Hostos Community College. And I serve as a co-moderator for today's event. The Velada series is sponsored by the Office of the President and we have an exciting program to present today. Uh, I wanna start with a quote from Frederick Douglass, who said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Some statistics that I want us to consider for today's topic is boys are likely to be held back in school. Boys are more likely to drop out of school than girls. If a boy does graduate from high school, he's less likely to go to college. If he does go to college, he's less likely to graduate. Boys are 16 times more likely to go to prison. And it's said to be a man, you must see a man. That speaks to the power of role models, but more important is the mentoring that good men can provide to boys. That brings us to today's Velada, Perspectives on Male Leadership and the Importance of Role Modeling. A friendly, friendly reminder that this event is being recorded and closed captioning is available at the bottom of the screen. Simply activate the tool if you need accessibility. We will be happy to take audience questions at the end of the program. Just type them into the question and answer and we'll read them for our panelists. Panelists, please be reminded to mute yourselves when you're not speaking so there's no background noise. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the president of Hostos, Dr. Daisy Coco de Filippis, who will bring greetings and welcome all. President. Oh, good afternoon, we went as tardes. I have to say, I am the only, uh, what is it? The only store among all these beautiful flowers here. Just <laughs> have all this stuff, but I'm very comfortable. I'm the mother of three sons and the sister in between two wonderful brothers. So I grew up with a lot of uh, in my family. I have some remarks that I would like to read. I cannot tell you how pleased I am to see you. I have met some of you, many of you, and, and our Zoom conversations, and I'm was so impressed and delighted. And I'm still, you know, just today we had a visitor who was uh, uh, the, the student trustee uh, who actually got to taste my flan, my Dominican flan, which is an invitation that's right there on the table, if you let us know, a couple of days in advance. And it was actually, she said she doesn't usually eat flan, but she liked it. This is as a way of tempting a wonderful guest to stop by at some point to hear some of the good things we are doing. So a brand of toxic masculinity has infiltrated our culture. Its corrosive effect can be seen everywhere from the world of entertainment to social media, to the political arena. Leaders pride themselves on dividing, not uniting, fostering hatred and bigotry, not love and acceptance. The destructive consequence of this behavior is sadly apparent in every, virtually every sphere of our public and private lives. What is today's discussion of, of such great importance? Because a healthy culture requires healthy role models. And we have wonderful role models here with us of what it means to be a man, un hombre. Um, Mahana Gandhi once observed, if we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards him. The change Gandhi speak of is indeed possible. I'm delighted to welcome, uh, I, we were expecting seven, I think I see five of you here, uh, but I'll mention everyone as if they may step in at whatever point to this Velada Congressman Jamal Bowman, State Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty, Assembly Member Jeff Denowitz, Assembly Member Kenny Burgos, Assembly Council Member Rafael Salamanca Jr., Council Member Kevin Riley, and Council Member Eric 
anyways, and that, you see that? What a wonderful, wonderful team that is. How great is that? So they are joined by our moderators, two of the college's finest male role models, Peter Mertens, the Interim Dean for Continuing Education and Workforce Development, and Radeski, Director of Governmental and External Affairs. Is thank you on behalf of our students. Uh, uh, it means a tremendous lot for you all to stop by and share a little bit of what your path has been and what made the difference in your lives. Thank you so very much. Mil gracias y bendiciones. Many blessings. Thank you very much, President, for those welcoming remarks. Um, all right, so now to introduce our panelists, our elected officials. Um, first, he is the Dean of the State Assembly's Bronx Delegation and the Chair of the Assembly's Committee on Codes, representing Assembly District 81. We have Assemblyman Jeff Dinowitz with us. Next, uh, he is one of the newest members of the Assembly's Bronx Delegation and a former Budget Director of the New York City Council, representing Assembly District 85. Assembly Member Kenny Burgos is here. Uh, next, he is a co-chair of the City Council's Bronx Delegation, a youth mentor and co-founder of the Dad Gang, representing Council District 12, and celebrating his birthday with us today. Council <laughs> Member Kevin Riley is here. And uh, last but not least, he is a former special education teacher, former committee chair on Bronx Community Board 8, representing Council District 11. Council Member Eric Dinowitz is here with us today. Thank you all for being here. Um, so we're going to get a, uh, a group discussion going and uh, my co-moderator, Peter Bertens and I will ask questions to the group. And we basically want everyone to just kind of toss the questions around. It doesn't have to be a formal um, response from every person. So just have, have fun with it. And the first question is, uh, please tell us about a mentor that you have had in your life. And uh, we'll start with the Dean of the Bronx Delegation, Assemblyman Dinowitz. Uh, hello, everybody. So I guess I've had a number of mentors. When I was young, uh, my, I guess my father was my main mentor. Um, he, he passed away when I was 11. And from that point on, I really was fortunate to have a lot of people in my life, uh, an uncle, um, my brothers, but also teachers who really acted as, as mentors. You know, it wasn't like there was one particular person, but I, was, I took my education very seriously. And I was lucky when I went to school, whether it was junior high school, high school, college, or beyond, uh, that people took an interest in me, just like I try to take an interest in, in younger people now, because I feel that I've benefited from um, the, the, the fact that other people cared about me. So I try to pay that back uh, it, the way I should. And, uh, but I think the real bottom line is that you have to, people have to focus on their education. And there are a lot of people in education. I mean, Eric, of course, was a teacher. Most teachers care a lot about their students. And I was certainly the beneficiary of teachers who cared about me. Okay. Uh, how about um, council member Dinowitz? Oh, sure. 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 Dinowitz and Dinowitz. Um, well, obviously, you know, like assemblyman Dinowitz, his father was one of his mentors. Uh, one of my mentors was my father, assemblyman Dinowitz. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's so important, whether it was in my life in general, in teaching, or now, especially in, in politics. Um, you know, we, we have, I, I think the phrase before, uh, I think before the forum started was toxic masculinity. Um, but I have in a father, someone who showed me that it's not about showing you're doing a, a, something important or looking like you're doing something important. It's about doing something for other people and, and, and doing the work, whether that's in your own way, some, for sometimes it's in your own quiet way. Um, but, you know, just in terms of, f from a political aspect, you know, I see in my father, the, the man who kept tens of thousands of people in their homes by passing the eviction moratorium three times. 
right? And he's not out there on rooftops shouting about how great he is doing it. He's not going on all the morning shows talking about how great he is. He's in his office. He's talking to people. He's talking to stakeholders, doing the work to help people. You know, and that's and that's such an important thing because it's not about you know, whether it was my job as a teacher, whether it's me as a father, or whether it's my job now as an elected official. It's it's not about me. It's about the people I was teaching. It's about the community that I represent. It's about my children and what I'm giving to them, not just uh, what I'm showing to them. So that was such such an important thing that I've learned and am lucky to still be still be learning from him. Council Member Riley. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, I think one of the phrases that was mentioned before was it's uh, way easier to build stronger children uh, than to repair broken men. Um, I was actually one of those broken um, adults, I want to say, because um, unfortunately, I didn't grow up uh, with my father. Uh, he was incarcerated when I was seven. So uh, growing up was really, really tough for me to kind of uh find someone that I could kind of meet and and kind of you know guide me to a, a you know a rightful path and I was grateful enough uh to to attend a lunch one day with uh assembly member Carl Hasty and um assembly member at the time Ruben Diaz Jr. uh when he was about to um run for borough president alongside uh one of my fraternity brothers and from there on right there uh just having those two men in my life especially um assembly member Hasty uh, kind of guiding me um, and setting me on the right path and kind of expanding my passion for public service because uh, I believe in my entire life um, with, with all I did when I was younger, I always wanted to serve and, and help people in my community. Um, but they actually expanded um, that passion uh, from that one luncheon, from me seeing them and seeing representation um, and seeing men, because like you just you said before, um, Peter, um, when we don't see men, it, it's kind of hard for us to be men. Uh, and I was raised by a single mother, uh, an older sister who's 10 years older than me. So I had two moms um, basically raising me. Um, so that's a challenge. And a lot of, you know, people in our communities are going through that same challenge now. So that's why it's so important for representation and for you to get a mentor. And Assembly Member Burgos. Yeah, much like everyone else on this call, um, I have multiple mentors. I think it's important to have mentors throughout every phase and chapter of life. You may not have someone that's going to you throughout the entirety. Jordan, if you are, you're blessed to have it. Uh, <clears throat> for me personally, I got my first start in government with uh, Councilwoman Annabelle Palm, who is now the Commissioner for Commission on Human Rights. And she gave me my mentored me throughout my career in government and helped me when I wanted to run for office. So, a lot to her. I owe a lot to others along the way from being a childhood to teenage years that have mentored me. And one of the big things, right? It's not enough to be mentored and to be guided into that path and that cycle. I look forward to paying it from my office, from my community. Oh, uh, Assembly Member Burgos, I just want to let you know we're having a little bit of trouble with your audio. Um, not sure what that is, but uh, just something to be aware of. I, was that breaking up? Or? Yeah, just a just a little bit, unfortunately. Okay, I'll try to fix that. Um, Dean Mertens, you're up next. Sure. So the second question we have is for each of you: is what makes a good mentor, and can anyone be a mentor? And Council Member Riley, if you could could start. Yeah, um, what makes a good mentor is somebody who can be fully transparent with their mentee. Um, the challenge that a lot of people um, get for asking for help, they don't want to feel embarrassed. They don't want to feel like they're they're stupid in lame terms or, or dumb, and, and they don't want someone to look down on them. For a mentor to be fully transparent with their mentee um, gives a way of uh, to be vulnerable. Because when you can be vulnerable with your mentor, you could kind of express what you're going through at certain breakpoints in your life where you really want to just quit and just uh, give up. Your mentor could kind of help you break through those moments, which makes you stronger. And the only way they'll get to those moments if your mentor shares with you that 
they also went through those times where they felt vulnerable, where they felt like they were broken and they wanted to quit. So I feel like a great mentor is somebody who's fully transparent. Uh, I feel like we could be transparent with someone, but we have to be sometimes fully transparent. I'm not saying air your dirty laundry, but um, share something with your mentee at that given moment that will help them break through a barrier where it's a challenge for them. And where it goes for anyone could be a mentor, yes, that, that's an open uh, playing field that anybody could play. And you don't have to be a certain weight, height, uh, ethnicity, anybody could be a gender, anybody could be a mentor. Um, and it's very important that we have more of those. Thank you. And uh, Assembly Member um, uh, Denowitz, if you can answer. I think the real bottom line is that a mentor should be somebody who cares about their mentee. And, and basically, if you've been given help, if you've been given support in the past, your job is to return the favor by giving support to somebody else in the future. And uh, the, the person just has to be somebody who cares about you, who cares uh, that you will you know, do the right thing, that you can be you know, taught. And, and there are a lot of people out there who feel that they got to repay uh, the benefits that they had um, from other people by passing it down to somebody else. And do you think anyone can be a, a, a mentor? Well, I'm not sure about anybody, but <laughs> there are probably some people who definitely should not be a mentor. But I think many, if not most people can be. Um, I, I think it's, you know, you, you really have to be willing to give uh, and, and to be supportive of other people. Um, you know, you can't be you know, stingy with your time. Uh, and, and if you want to do the right thing by other people, then you probably can be a mentor. But as I said, there are probably some people, no, not everybody. Thank you. And Council Member Dinowitz. Yeah, how do I how do I top Assembly Member Dinowitz and and Council Member <laughs> Riley? I think I think yes. Number one is is you have to care. You have to want to help someone, and no one could. I don't think anyone should be could be forced into a position where they have to take on a mentor mentee relationship. But um, because it, it has to be something in your heart that makes you want to give. Whether it was thinking back to an experience you did have and say I want to pay it forward. Or an experience you didn't have, which is to say, you know, I never had something growing up that I want to be able to give to the next generation. But as Councilmember Riley said, being honest and transparent. And you know, 14 years in the classroom, I've um, had some successes and failures. Um, but you know, the number one thing the students always knew was that I was honest with them. And so even when I told them things that were difficult or that they didn't want to hear, um, they knew They knew because of building that relationship with me that I, I was being myself, my genuine self, I was being honest and, and, they, tr and they trusted me. Um, so that, that was, you know, that was something that was really, really vital in that relationship. So, so yeah, you gotta want it. You have to want some part of you to help people and, as you're in your mentor mentee relationship, be transparent and honest. And, you know, just, you know, just like it's people aren't sure if they want a mentor. Sometimes mentors aren't even sure how to be a mentor and that's okay. And it's, you know, I think one of the most refreshing and important things is that they're honest about that. And I think that goes a lot farther and it's so much more important to do than a mentor who pretends that they have the answers all the time, every single time. No, I don't think anyone who's looking for guidance is expecting that. They're expecting a genuine, honest person who cares. As a former New York City school teacher myself, having taught sixth grade and then third grade, students can smell dishonesty oh, uh, yes. comes out of your mouth. And, and, and always leading with honesty is the best thing. Assemblyman Burgos, uh, uh, your comments on the question. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, without uh, trying to repeat what everyone else has said, because we've given so many great answers, 
Um, I think you just obviously at first and foremost have to want to be a mentor, right? You have to genuinely want to put forth that effort. Uh, but I think a really important part of being a mentor is not only sharing successes and advice on, you know, how to be successful in life, but always sharing the mistakes you've made in hopes of teaching that young person to not make the mistakes you have been made, right? To short, shorten the path that he or she is going on uh, because your life experiences are so valuable to them. If, you're, if there's someone like me, I tend to learn from someone else's mistakes and it's been so helpful in my life when people, when my mentors have told me, you know, this is where I messed up. This is where I screwed up along the way. Uh, and this is the route you should take. So being vulnerable, being open, honest and transparent has been a theme here. And, and I think it's absolutely correct. And I just want to comment that there are questions in the questions and answer. We're going to go through the prepared questions and then at the end, we'll get to all of the questions that are in the, the question and answers. Um, I'd like to just uh, let everyone know that we've been joined by Congressman Jamal Bowman. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Congressman. Um, I want to give you a chance to, uh, to say hello and to give greetings. I do want to tell everyone that Congressman Bowman sits on the House Committee on Education and Labor and the Subcommittee on Higher Education and Workforce Investment. So, Congressman Bowman. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Hello to all of the young men of Hostos out there. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure to connect. And, uh, you know, just wanted to offer myself and my office as a resource uh, to all of the young men uh, and people on this call. Uh, you know, as a young man growing up, unfortunately, I did not have a father in the home with me. Uh, so mentors and male role models and figures uh, outside of my home became very important to me. Uh, so that was coaches, that was, that was teachers, uh, and that was just, you know, older gentlemen who, who hung out on the corner and just spent time with us just to provide uh, guidance and wisdom in, in, a, in a variety of forms. But I can clearly identify uh, people in my life who are just important and transformative. You know, Mr. Eldridge, uh, my seventh grade uh, English teacher, Mr. Harrell, my um, eighth grade uh, science teacher, um, Sal Mistretta, uh, my high school uh, football coach. And then there were uh, individuals in sort of pop culture and, and hip hop culture who were also mentors to me. I mean, these people were like, were like superheroes to me because that was the only spaces we really saw uh, confident, uh, brilliant, creative, articulate uh, black male voices. So in my generation, that was uh, Chuck D from Public Enemy, KRS-One uh, from the Boogie Down Bronx. That was Rakim from Eric B and Rakim. That was Brother J from X-Clan. Uh, and many others. And, you know, there's a saying that you you can't be what you don't see. And, and for me to see those people uh, doing incredible work and just being brilliant uh, was something that was that was really impactful for me. And, and I also want to say I was lucky to have an incredible mother. Like my mom was just, you know, the most incredible human being that anyone can have. Um, and she, you know, she gave me three things. She gave me love, she gave me stability, and she gave me self-confidence. Um, and I was also a kid who, you know, I wasn't a straight A student. I didn't go to Ivy League schools. I didn't grow up rich. Um, I didn't have, you know, there weren't many in my life who, who you know, accomplished much. Um, but what my mother gave me, that foundation helped me to sort of grow it and become you know, my best self. And, and, and being your best self, and I'll close with this, is not about, uh, you know, like I happen to be a member of Congress, I happen to be an elected official, but it's not about a job or a title. Um, it's about your integrity and it's about your character. And even bef before coming to Congress, I was in education for 20 years um, as a teacher, guidance counselor, middle school principal, and now that I'm in Congress, I, I, I'm still an educator. Like that is the mindset I bring to the work that I do each and every day, which is all about serving and helping people. Um, so regardless of who you are, what you're going through, you know, you, I encourage you all to be, to have, to pay attention to your inner voice and follow your instincts and intuition. And, and you'll discover 
uh, the path that you're supposed to be on, whatever that, whatever that intuition uh, 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 tells you. And then the other thing is, is, is help people. Do whatever you can to help someone just for the sake of helping someone, you know, and help your community just for the sake of helping your community, not to get paid or any of that, because going through that process is also a process of healing as well. Uh, you know, and, and we all need healing, especially now after COVID, because we've all done, dealt with a tremendous trauma. Um, so thank you. Uh, I, I'll stay on as long as I can. I'm in between votes, uh, but I just wanted to come and say peace and love and hello to everyone. Thank you, Congressman. We appreciate you coming to us um, live in between votes in the House. Um, okay, let's go to the next question. Um, and we'll, we'll start with Assemblymember Burgos this time. Uh, young men often don't ask for help even when they need it. Do you think they are reluctant to seek out mentoring relationships? And if so, how do we change that? Uh, I'll take it one step further. I think not only young men, I know adult men, grown men who are reluctant sometimes to ask for help. Uh, unfortunately, it's you know consistent. I think um, you know throughout demographics, uh, males across the board, and yeah, they are reluctant, and it shouldn't be because just us as humans, us as young men, as adult men, should always look for one another, look for help. No one does this alone. Uh, I'm never a believer in the in someone that's completely self-made, everyone is always assisted or supported by someone. Everyone has that support system. And there should be no shame in that. Uh, we all do better as a group. There's, there should always be a focus on team and unity and building and just building that network of support. And I always encourage young men, adult men, ask for help. Reach out to your support system. It'll help you to go much further. Uh, and again, as I said before, pay that forward. Uh, Council Member Dinowitz. Yeah, what, uh, one of the things I spoke a lot about uh, in my council campaign, which was you know this year, um, was the need for social emotional learning and mental health education in our schools and more robust. And the way I broke it down was very simply say, saying that one of the hardest things that for students to do in the class was say, I need help. Just like Assemblymember Burgos said, it's I need help. And that's one of the most important things that our young men can do. It's one of the things we're trying uh, to address in the council with funding for community schools um, and and you know social workers and things like that, it is hard. I, I I think that a lot of kids, a lot of young men, want the help. And so when I started teaching and have a bunch of kids want to like hang out with me after school, or come up during lunch, or just stay a little extra after class, they wouldn't say, "Hey, I want a male role model in my in my life." That's sort of a a weird way to phrase it. Um, but when I spoke to them and learned about their lives, the, a lot of my students who would be staying with me after school and staying coming up during lunch were those young men who didn't have a father or whose father was incarcerated um, or who didn't, who didn't have a father for, for what, in, in their life or didn't play an active role in their life. And so very often what I saw is, is young men seeking out that help. And it's very hard to, and it's, a, it's again, like it's kind of a weird thing to say is I want, a men, I want a mentor, where do I sign up? So it's, so it is up to us to teach our children how to ask for help, how to, how to express their needs emotionally, but it's also up to us as, as adult men to try to look for that and try to recognize that our, that our young men very often do want that. And if we just open our eyes and open our hearts to it, that, we will find more of those mentor-mentee relationships. We have to look at. We have to look for it. Council Member Riley, uh, I think when you look at men, uh, we all seek validation uh, from each other, whether it's a, a older male or amongst our peers. We all seek some form of validation from each other, but we're kind of embarrassed to admit that. Um, as a child, we're all. At, well, I'm going to speak for me in my community and people that I know and young men that I know. Um, it's kind of hard uh, seeking, uh, I guess, help because you don't want to feel like uh, you need help because you're taught and you're built to be tough. You're taught to kind of figure it out um, and be tough. You're a boy. You're a, be a man. Be a man. That's all we, we you keep hearing that terminology when you're a young kid. 
And that sticks for a lot of us. I, I know it stuck with me, especially um, me losing my father. Like the last time I physically saw a, a man in my household was in handcuffs. So that visibility to me just stated, and that was at seven years old. So that was at a very tender age where I'm programmed to kind of feel like I'm going to go down the same route or I just had to figure it out. And then to go outside and then ask somebody if they're not being fully transparent, if they're not being vulnerable, if I feel like they're just coming to just do it for show, I don't feel comfortable enough to open up to them. That's why um, when I, when you said what makes a good mentor, I always said, I, that's why I stated that it's really uh, imperative to be transparent and vulnerable with your mentee where they can open up to you in moments where they're going, where they're at a ceiling that you need to help them break through. Like we have to continue to lift as we climb. And, and that, that is a, a mantra that um, um, MBK, my brother's keeper, President Obama's foundation that he started, uh, which I was a part of, um, that was a, a foundation that we kind of um, ran on because we wanted to make sure that we continue to lift as we climb. Like you're going to go through those tough moments, but you want to make sure that you're so you're able to connect with that young brother. And even as Kenny stated, there's older brothers now. That's why we formulated the dad game because becoming a black father um, in today's society, when you didn't see a father within your household, it's tough. Like there's things that you, you get uh, faced with that you didn't know that could possibly happen. And it's tough. And you need to reach out to other men who are going through these situations. So it, it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's tough, man. Uh, we, we have to con we have to change the way that we're building our sons. Um, we have to teach them and build them with love instead of toughness. Like take the bricks away and, and put some feathers and, and, and lead with a heart um, instead of leading our men down the road to just be tough because it's hard being tough at sometimes. And sometimes you, you, you be so tough that you're kind of pushing all the love away. Um, so we, we really need to kind of build our men with more love. And uh, Assembly Member Dinowitz? So... Think about this for a minute. Why is it that men won't ask directions when they're driving the car? Why is it that men vote in so few numbers compared to women? Why is it that men don't go to doctors in the same proportion that women do? And I think the answer is from day one, boys and girls are raised differently, they're taught differently. And we talk often about the fact that uh, girls and young women kind of get the short end of the stick in so many ways and in, in various forms of discrimination. And that's all true. But on the other hand, boys also get the short end of the stick. I think they're disciplined differently in school. I think they're more likely to be suspended for doing the same thing. Um, they, they're, they're treated differently. And we have to not teach our young men and our boys uh, that they, we have to teach them that they can ask for help that they can be more collaborative. I think it's probably true. I will say this, some people may say this is sexist. I think on, as a general rule, girls are more collaborative than boys are. That's not because of, of, of the way they're born, it's because of the way they're taught. Uh, I, I, it was mentioned at the beginning that a much smaller percentage of, of um, young men graduate high school and go to college than girls. The numbers actually are alarming. I know the numbers at Hostos is extraordinarily imbalanced. In fact, this, um, this webinar that we're doing right now, look at the list of people who are tuned into it. There are twice as many women as men that are tuned in for an event that I thought was directed mostly at men. Um, so I think that if we want to really make the changes we need to make, we have to teach children differently than we do now from day one. And, and it's true, not everybody has uh, the, the role models they need. As I said earlier, I did not have a father at home um, after, uh, after a certain age. And you know, a lot of people are, were in the same situation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, I was, that we, we should be taught differently. Everybody has to be taught the same. Boys should not be taught that they, that they can't ask for directions because that shows that they're not independent or they're not strong. We just have to look at things a lot differently than we do right now. Thank you. And um, Congressman Bowman, would you like to weigh in on this one? Yeah, sure. Um, this is a great question and great discussion. I, I think 
Uh, and shout out to all the women out there. I didn't realize we had uh, also had young women on the call. So shout out to all of you. By the way, everything that we've said applies to you too. So it's not just not just for young men. Uh, but in terms of young men, um, young women as well, but definitely young men, we, we are often raised in an environment uh, that encourages us to be hyper-masculine. And that hyper-masculinity often becomes toxic masculinity. And that toxic masculinity could be destructive to ourselves based on how we treat ourselves or other people and our extended community. And throughout my life, I've come to realize that, uh, that that is wrong and that my greatest strength is my vulnerability and my ability to submit to the reality that I don't have all the answers and I don't know and understand everything and that is okay. Um, that helps me to ask questions, uh, you know, ask for directions when I'm driving ask for help in a variety of different environments and seek out collaboration as opposed to trying to trying to go at things alone. Um, especially if you're a young person who comes from very vulnerable circumstances in a vulnerable environment. We need each other um, and we need others in order to both discover uh, our best selves and be our best selves. So you know, everyone's not going to be physically the strongest or the toughest or know all of the answers or get everything right. Be like, you know, be vulnerable. You know, be honest with yourself. That vulnerability leads to self-honesty. And that's where you discover your real power as a young man or young woman. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, the, the next question I want to ask, and we're going to ask you to think a little bit, is an example of when you've been a role model and what was something that was worked and made it a good mentorship? And then tell us one of the challenges you had in that mentor relationship. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna- I wanna go, I wanna go first. I, excellent. Just, just because you, I have to leave, just because I have to leave. Uh, so I'm gonna skip my, my colleagues. <laughs> um, but um, so, I. Yes, I'm going to talk about the mentor relationship, but when I want to, I want to talk about my son, if that's okay. I have a 20 year old son, and you know, I was 25 when he was born, and in my mind, I couldn't wait to raise him to be just like me, and I couldn't wait wait to raise him to be an athlete, you know, become professional, be an all star, and and just be everything that I I wanted to be and tried to be. And he, he taught me very quickly that he is nothing like me. He is not like me at all. And that was, I had to reorient my thinking in order to be a good father to him. And, and he taught me that, he taught me patience. He, he taught me empathy. I mean, to, to be who I was and to have a son who didn't want to throw the football around was like what the, it was like traumatic <laughs> for me. Right. Um, but he taught me all the things I needed to be the best father that I could be to him. And, you know, I know this is a question about mentors, but, uh, you know, when you're a father, you're all of the above. You're a mentor, you're a teacher, you're all of those things. And I'm just so grateful that I have a son who's his emotional intelligence is, is way higher than mine. Um, his empathy is way higher than mine. Um, you know, and, and, and he doesn't play sports and, and that's fine. Um, so I had to learn about him and then meet him where he was. But it was tough for me and for him, you know, because it was like, even, you know, in two recent years, dad, I can't talk to you about this because you, you, you're you too rough or you go too hard or you expect me to do this. And, you know, and, and I have had to like, so it's an ongoing thing. It's like you learn, but you're constantly growing and and it's an ongoing thing. And, and I, I'm sure the mentor-mentee relationship is is similar. You have to, just like in teaching, and, I, and Eric will speak to this as well. You got to meet kids where they are. You got to meet people where they are. 
Thank, thank you. Thank you for that answer. As the father of a 20 year old son and the exact reverse type of relationship, I totally, totally understand that. Um, uh, Assemblyman Dinowitz, if you don't mind going next. Uh, what, sure. what was an example of a good mentorship and what was challenging about it in that case? Well, well, first of all, with my own kids, I like to think I was a good role model and and uh, I never, correctly. I don't, good job. what was that? I said, you think correctly, good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one thing I also learned, uh, I guess similar to the Congressman, that there was nothing I could do to get my kids to do what I want them to do. They, they're gonna do whatever they wanna do. They're not gonna, uh, they're not gonna go into the profession that I want. I mean, I, it never occurred to me that they would wanna get involved in politics, for example. Um, I would never tell them when, well, maybe I would, but it wouldn't work. I would never tell them when they should have kids and stuff like that. None of that stuff works. I think if you're a good mentor, you don't even think of yourself as a mentor. I mean, I have a, I have a, a number of colleagues I help all the time, especially new colleagues. I don't think of myself as their mentor because that kind of in my head would make me feel old or something. But I think you, you want to you wanna work with people and you want to help people. And I think that's what makes a good mentor. Um, it, it's really that simple. Uh, you know, I, I never went up to somebody and says, uh, let's be mentor mentee. No, no. But I, th I think when you collaborate with people, um, th that's how it is. You know, when, when I first got elected to the assembly back in um, uh, previous century, um, I was I, like everybody else. I was brand new. I was, you know, somewhat younger than most of the people there. And I counted on on some of my colleagues to you know help me out a little bit to point me in the right direction, and uh, and and I think that's how it works. And now I've been there for quite a while, and I I try to be helpful, especially if somebody asks for help, uh, because we're all like a team, I think. And so I guess if you're a good mentor, you don't even necessarily think of yourself as a mentor. You're just doing what you should be doing. And what would be a challenge that you found in any of those mentor relationships? When people don't listen to what I say. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a father of four. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you. And uh, um, Assemblyman uh, Burgess, if you don't mind following up. Yeah, so I grew up with three sisters. I had no brothers. Um, but I, find my, I found myself being a mentor to at least two of them. They were both younger than me. Uh, but one in particular, my younger sister, Destiny, is five years younger than me. And, you know, I mean, she looked up to me for a, a lot of things, you know, whether she was sporty, she was inquisitive, she was analytical. And I think she took a lot from me. Um, and, and I'm happy for that. You know, I, I was proud to be able to guide her through life. Her father figure was kind of in and out. We didn't have the same father, same mother. We had the same mother, different fathers. Sorry. Um, but the challenge became when she reached a certain point, I think many people reach this point where the student becomes a teacher, right? Where she then takes all the lessons she learned from me and she's able to apply it in a point where she then turns around on me and I catch myself, maybe not practicing what I preach. I catch myself maybe not living up to the expectation or the image of what she had of me. And it was challenging because she's then exposing, right, my vulnerabilities, my flaws, and making me look inside myself. Uh, but I was grateful for it. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful part of the process in being a mentor, where your mentee uh, has basically excelled and taken everything you've taught him or her, uh, and then now brings it to you, and you almost become a student all over again. I think everyone should always strive to constantly you know self be self-aware analyze themselves no matter what age you are what, what part of life you're in uh, so I think it's a beautiful thing thank you and, and council member Riley uh thank you Peter uh I'll share something real quick uh I'm a brother of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated um and I have I'm a pro fight to one of my neophytes uh who crossed in 2016 2017 I hope he doesn't hear this because he'll get mad I don't remember the year um, but he was graduating from college. And as many of us know, Kenny knows he went to Albany. Um, Eric knows like when you graduate from college and the transition back to uh, community after you were just at school for four, four to five years is it, a big transition. You went from partying on the weekends, having your own apartment to moving back in with your parents. Um, and with this mentee now, he went to go into nursing. 
Um, so what I kind of explained to him is, hey, I got my, because when I, I graduated college in 2010, um, but then I didn't get my master's to 2018. So it was a big gap between then. When I, when I stayed to him, I was like, hey, if you really know that you wanted to do this. And the reason why there was a gap is because I was indecisive. But he was uh, very decisive and knew that he wanted to make sure that he was a nurse. So I shared with him, like, hey, you could take that year off from college uh, to take a break, but you need to go right back into it. Because if you wait longer, it's probably not going to happen because you're probably going to get comfortable and other life um, situations may happen, which will prevent you from your main goal. Uh, he listened um, and he did it. And I say the biggest challenge was actually um, having him be responsible enough to go to class and kind of cut off his social um, life. Because, uh, uh, and, Ken, and Kenny could probably adjust this, well, uh, attest to this, but as soon as you leave college, especially being uh, frat boys like we are, it's kind of hard being detached from that lifestyle, partying all the time uh, and, and kind of having your own kind of space when you're right back in with your parents, if you don't have your own kind of setup. Uh, so just giving him that discipline and, and kind of speaking to him. And I had to be with him um, on a continuous basis. So something that we, a hobby that we both found that we both enjoy was going to um, work out, work out, go out to exercise. So we went to the gym together, which gave me a time period where I constantly got to see him every week. So I could kind of push this in him, not, aggressively but kind of adding it during the workout like yeah good job man you see how you just got through that you could get through um, another one of your problems that you're going through because he he failed his first semester but he's about to graduate nursing school next semester All right congratulations that's great and uh council member Dinowitz. uh one of the one of the challenges about one of my mentees um i think it's a similar challenge to I, i'm thinking of one kid right now um you know, Kevin, uh, sorry, Councilmember Riley, um, you know, early on spoke a lot about what it means to be a, a black man or black boy growing up without a father and being a mentor to other young black boys who have the same experience. And as a public school teacher in the Bronx, when almost all of or all of my students were, you know, children of color and they have completely different stories than I do. Right. I, I grew up, my, you know, my father was there, grew up middle class, good neighborhood uh, in the Bronx. Um, and you know, one of the things I, I was always trying to that I always was concerned would be a challenge was, all right, I got I'm thinking of this kid. I'll call him Ed. This kid, Ed, he was not the same, you know, race as I was. He looked different than I was than I do. He a different upbringing and his hobbies were different. He was very into dance, like dancing. And I am, well, very bad at it. <laughs> I don't even try. <laughs> and so you know, I have this kid who has a totally different story than I do, totally different background, totally different upbringing, totally different hobbies. And yet he, you know, he and I developed this relationship and the, th the one thing he remembers the most and that he still talks about with me to this day is not, um, you know, necessarily that I came to his dance shows, um, which he appreciated, even though I couldn't partake in them. You know, I couldn't relate on that level. He appreciated that I came out. He appreciated um, that I was also his teacher and that I helped him through difficult subjects. This was a kid with a, with, a, with a disability, helped him through difficult subjects. The one thing he remembers is that I taught him how to tie a tie. You know, that was, that was the one thing that he took away to this, to, to this day. And I think it goes back to, you know, what I think all of us were talking about before is what are our children, what are our young, young men looking for? I don't necessarily think it's someone who looks like you or has the same experiences as you. I think they're looking for someone who's there for you, who cares for you, and is just honest and transparent. So I was very honest with him. I said, I don't know what dance moves those were. <laughs> those are great. And I was there for him. I enjoy them. I, and, and I think that's, that was a challenge. It was more of an internal challenge. Um, but again, at the end of the day, throughout my career um, with my, with my students, the thing that they appreciated was, and the thing they cared about was that honesty uh, and that I was there for them. Okay. So I want to go to one of the questions that's been submitted in the Q and A. 
And um, Daisy asks, do you feel as a mentor or a person that people look up to or idolize that you've ever failed them? Basically, have you ever failed in that type of position? Um, and we'll, we'll give the hard question to uh, Assembly Member Dinowitz to begin. Oh, thanks. Um, you know, I, I'm sure there are many times that each of us don't accomplish what we want, that we don't succeed, yes, that we fail. I think what people care about is that you care about them and that you try. People, most people understand you're not gonna always get the result you want. And so, yeah, is, I, I think the, the important thing is you're trying to be helpful to somebody and that's what really counts. And I just have to apologize because at 4.30, I have to sign off, I'm sorry, but um, I have to. Uh, so that's what counts. And as, as has been mentioned, you know, transparency, openness, honesty, that's much appreciated by people. People can, you know, young people, everybody can see through you when you're not being honest, when you're, you know, trying to pull the wool over their eyes. So uh, you have to try and you have to be honest with them. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, Assemblyman. Um, let's go to uh, Council Member Dinowitz. Yeah, I think it's, I don't know if failure's the right word. You know, there's always times where um, you want to or could have done more, but I think it's sort of in that same vein as that, that emotional skill of asking for help, right? Asking for help is not saying I, I have a weakness. Asking for help is saying, I, I, you know, I want to do better at something. And in that same vein, a mentor wants to do better for their mentee. And it doesn't mean that the mentee um, is going to achieve 100% perfection in every single area now that they have a mentor. But if you, but, but I, 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 and that's, and that's okay, right? That's, you know, if you're building that relationship of trust and transparency, the relationship isn't, I'm going to get you to be the all-star number one person in everything. The relationship is we're going to, we're going to work together um, and I'm going to do my best for you. And you're going to do better, you know, just by, just by feeling like you're, you're asking for help. You're asking to do better. And, and that's, and, and that's where that asking to do better and being a mentor, that, that relationship sort of exists. It exists in that same world. Thank you. Uh, Council member Riley. Uh, yes. Uh, I'll speak about a uh, recent failure. Um, prior to me becoming a council member while I was working with Speaker Hasty, I had a second job where I was a skills coach um, to New York Fountain, which is a foster agency um, that operated out of the Bronx um, by Southern Boulevard. And as a skills coach, uh, we get cases where we get foster kids. Um, predominantly, I will work with men, uh, young boys. Um, and I will work with them and, and kind of teach some life skills. But the only issue with the program, which I didn't like really, um, you only get a certain amount of time to be with them. Um, so I had this, uh, this one kid um, named Kayshawn, um, and he had a younger brother named Xavier. Um, so at that time, um, when we had the program, I had Kayshawn in my case, but I didn't have Xavier. And Xavier was a little younger than Kayshawn, but he just loved my interaction with Kayshawn and just wanted to be on one to come with us, but at that time, being with the job per, um, parameters, we could not have another kid on the case load. Uh, fast forward, uh, um, after K. Sean got off my case load, I was able to go see them on my own, um, but life started coming. I had children, things of that nature, and they both got involved in the game. Um, if you guys saw the New York Post, um, and the Daily News this summer, uh, one of those young kids that were gunned down uh, was the younger brother, Xavier Wilson. Um, and that would be a case where I said, I feel like I failed because when you become a mentor, you really care. I'm um, not saying that it was my job necessarily to do so because I already fulfilled my obligation, but my moral obligation wasn't fulfilled because I feel like I let him through the cracks. I could have been around more where I could have saved him for not going down that path where he ended up, you know, being uh, a case uh, of gun violence. So that would be a case that I would say I, I failed. That's why now when I do say I want to be someone's mentor, I try to make sure that I'm in that person's life. I have some time to be a part of that person's life. I find something that we could do. That's why I said it's always good to pick a hobby with your mentor. 
because it's something that you could do together where you could kind of share that time together where you're able to connect with them um, on a more continuous basis. So that would be a time I would say I actually failed. Thank you. Um, Assembly member Burgos. I apologize. I think I, I may have taken a call quickly when the question was asked. Can you just repeat it for me? Oh yeah, sure. Of course. Um, the question is, um, do you feel as a mentor or person that people look up to, uh, can you give an example of a time where you failed? Uh, oof, I mean, I think it, it's easy to, to feel like, you know, sometimes you're not ever doing enough, at least for me. Um, and that can often feel like failure. I think it'd be difficult for me right now to identify one, you know, specific moment. Um, but it's difficult, you know, just to reaffirm yourself to know what you're doing is right. You know, you're, you're putting your best effort forward and you have the right intentions. Um, but, you know, it can often feel like you may not be doing enough. And to me, that sometimes does come across as failure in my eyes. Uh, so just you have to sometimes have that self-affirmation, knowing you're doing your best you can to be a mentor to someone, guiding them in the path, you know, teaching the lessons that you've learned in life. Uh, and that's really the best you can do. Like Kevin said, you know, you, you have to put your best foot forward, but unfortunately there's always outside factors and parameters that you can never be in control of. Um, so I don't have a specific one at this moment, unfortunately, but I hope that was uh, at least, you know, a decent answer towards it. Thank you. Another question that is in the question and answers again from Daisy Carolina is how do you feel about this new generation called mentor or influencer? that are from the social media platforms like YouTube or TikTok, where people are racking up millions of followers for things that they post. What's your general comment on, on that kind of position people have? Um, 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 uh, let's see, Council Member Riley, would you mind going first? Well, I, I it's different times that we live in. So it's I don't want to come here to bash it, because it's an opportunity for others to make money, um, to get brand deals and things of that nature to build their brand. Now, when it comes to our youth or people, I can't even say our youth because we have adults, even us in our generation that go to social media and we're kind of looking at individuals, influencers, uh, people that put a perfect picture out there. Um, and that's what we feel like our life should look like. So my my advice is to understand, like the same way you will watch, uh, go to AMC, Regal, uh, any movie theater to kind of watch a movie, kind of see that as social media, because people only put out what they want to put out in the movie or what they want to put out on social media. I don't think you should go on social media and look at an influencer or somebody on social media as a mentor. I think a mentor, it, it shouldn't even be a, a Zoom kind of tactic. You have to get more in person with your mentors um, so you can connect with them. That's how you build trust. That's how you kind of build transparency. That's how you build resiliency amongst your mentors where they could kind of get to hear you, feel you and kind of I mean, what well, I mean, feel you like feel what you're saying on, on, a, on, a, on a connection. Um, so I don't want to bash those individuals because it is a lane for a lot of people our age to make money. Um, to make influencers, to get brand deals and things of that nature. But when it comes to going on there and looking for a mentor or looking for someone that you should live your life as, that's not something you should do. People are only going to, comparison is the thief of joy. Uh, just want to put that out there. Comparison is the thief of joy. If you have social media, you're comparing yourself to people all day. You're comparing yourself to people who have the same job, people who look like you, people are the same age. It's going to steal your joy. They're only everyone's just putting things out there that are positive things that are happening great in their life, but you don't know how they got there. So with that being said, go out there, get a mentor so you can know how they got there. You know how they got up that ladder so they can help you get up that ladder also. Thank you. And assembly member uh, Burgess. Well, first I'll say that is uh, a really interesting and, and honestly an excellent question. So kudos to who, who asked that, that question. And I'll say, it's a double-edged sword um, in my eyes. You know, I think what Councilman Riley said is very true. You have to be mindful, right? The intention, <clears throat> yeah, but we have to also understand that we're living in a new era. Um, so you can watch these videos, you can, you know, engage with them, enjoy the content, maybe even learn from them. 
uh, but be mindful of sometimes what their intention is, what their goal is, you know, maybe a hidden agenda. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. But on the flip side of that, I sympathize with folks who, you know, may not have access to a mentor or maybe not a mentor in the lane or industry or field that they are seeking, <clears throat> right? We're here in New York City, 9 million people, you're bound to find someone in, in the same hobbies or interests as you, uh, but, you know, expanding that view to the country, the world, you know, we live in this global interconnectivity in a time that's never existed ever in, in human history, where now you can look at videos for an interest that you've never even seen before. And now you can look to this person almost as a mentor, you can learn from them. And there are things to be learned from everyone. Um, so it, it, it is a, it is that double edged sword where, you know, they can maybe serve as a mentor in, in some regards. Uh, but like Councilman Riley says, you just have to always be mindful what the ulterior motive, I guess, is, you know, unfortunately, because that's just the nature of YouTube and social media and the era we live in. Thank you. And uh, Asylum uh, Denoitz. Close. Oh, okay. Councilman. Councilman, I'm sorry. I know. We, we made it very confusing for you. I apologize. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I think it's a, a good question. It's just, I, I think it's important... It, I should never speak after Councilmember Riley because he always says it best. Um, but thinking of it more in terms of like a movie or a TV show, I think it's totally okay, even though it may be the best representation or a fake representation of someone. It, it's okay to get inspiration from something else. If it's a YouTube video, I've gotten inspiration from the movie Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. We started out this panel by saying... But with a quote saying it's easier to build strong children than repair broken men. All of that's okay for inspiration, um, for information. It's, it is not the same as a mentor mentee relationship. It's not the same as having a person in your life who cares about you. Those are, those are not the, the, the same thing. So, so as Councilman Riley said, considering it more like a movie or any other sort of medium, but you're at a distance. You're not with someone who's really giving giving you what you need, giving you that relationship, that, as we keep talking about, that trust and that care and that openness. Okay, um, the next question comes from Andrea. This is from the Q&A. Uh, she says, in Latin America, there is a concept called machismo that is widespread through many generations of men. Could culture also play a role on men and the way they are able to pick and choose their mentors? And uh, let's go to Assembly Member Burgos first on this one. Absolutely. I mean, uh, culture has huge influence on individuals, whether it be men or women or, or anyone in between. I mean, in the culture, we, we, the culture is really, you know, what I think guides you and, 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 you know, gives you your character and your upbringing, at least in, in the beginning of your life, right? You know, I mean, for me personally, growing up, I grew up in a culture of, you know, a big family, a Puerto Rican family, where it was a very machismo energy there, right? There was, there was an understanding, there was a certain understanding of what men had to be, what they had to do, what they had to look like, what they had to take care of. And it wasn't until I got to high school and college where then you're exposed to all different types of culture, especially here in New York City, and those molds are then broken. You start to see, you know, flaws in some of these views, and then you've expanded your viewpoint and, and you do what works best for you, hopefully. That's the idea, right, of merging cultures and having this melting pot. But essentially, when you grow up in this bubble of culture and family, you know, there's many, many great things about it, uh, but there are the cons of being in a bubble. And you're going to complete, you're going to continue to kind of replicate that exact cycle if you stay within that bubble. So culture can absolutely do that. Uh, Council member Dinowitz. Yeah, for sure. I, I think one of the sort of best um, representations of how culture changes overall is by looking at children's books. Right. Those are, you know, you can say, oh, when I was a kid, we used to learn this or we can recall we used to learn that. But I think in our children's books and I have books that from uh, from my children that, you know, I had when I was a kid, and I'm reading them now and I'm thinking, you know, this is not the sort of message that I necessarily uh, want to teach my, my children um, and not, you know, not just about 
um, the roles of, of men in society. You know, we're talking about, you know, things like, um, you know, body image, um, the, the way we talk about people from different cultures. Um, and I, maybe as an aside, I'll, I'll share, I'll share some of those books with you to show you that these exist. And now you, you look at books that are published now and so many more books are being published talking about emotions and social emotional intelligence and having a fear, having a, you know, having a want, a need, a desire, and talking about them and dealing uh, with, with frustration uh, and having books, children of different genders and races and backgrounds represented. Um, and so, so there's most certainly a cultural component, um, but, but again, if, if one spent another three hours looking at children's literature throughout just the past few, few decades and see how it's re re reflected, I think there certainly is a shift in that culture and a shift for the better, by the way, and a shift I'm very glad to be buying and borrowing these new books uh, from my kids that, that, that teach them all the, my kids are six and a half. You might've heard them just come home screaming because that's what they do. Um, come home. And I'm just really, really glad to be reading that to them and trying to teach them, um, you know, about, you know, about culture and, and the culture that um, does play a role in, in the way my children are going to one day pick their mentors. And council member Riley. Uh, yeah, I think uh, both of my colleagues are answering it uh, straight to the point. Um, it has a lot to do with how our students and our youth pick their mentors. Um, I'll, give, I'll go even deeper with demographic also. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, somebody that looks a lot, exactly like you, but somebody that looks like somewhere you came from. Um, or look like somebody that's somewhere you came from. Um, that's why a lot of times where I try to go talk to the youth, or any times I'm talking to anybody where I feel like I, I shouldn't put on a suit all the time or just be more comfortable uh, so they could kind of I could bridge that gap. Uh, I, I they don't feel like I'm talking above them or things of that nature. And that's what they're saying to me. Um, they they feel more comfortable talking to me because I look exactly like them. I, I meet them where they are. It's exactly what. Um, Council Member Dinowitz and Congress Member Bowman said as being educators, you have to kind of meet people where they're at sometimes. Um, and with that being said, um, yeah, I think culture, demographic, that has a lot to do with how people pick their mentors. I pick my mentor um, for two elected officials who I feel best represented how I feel like I look. Um, so those are my two mentors in politics. So I definitely feel like demographic and, and one is black and one is Hispanic. Um, and I'm a black I'm a black man that has families from Jamaica and neither um, of those individuals um, have Jamaican descendants. So it really goes from demographic. It go go from culture. Um, it could go from, um, I, I guess, just representation of someone that you kind of feel like looks like you. Can I just say one thing that's really interesting, you know, listening to what you said that I thought was so interesting is that, you know, Councilman Riley makes the choice to dress um, like, like, you know, like the, the, the kids who, so they can see themselves in that. I actually, you know, I, I spoke before about I didn't look like my students um, and I actually made a different choice. And when I started teaching, I was 21 years old. So one of the reasons I made this choice and the choice was to wear a button down shirt and a tie every day to work. That choice was in part because I needed to look older than my students who were literally a few months or a year younger than I was. Um, but the other thing is I sort of, you know, understood that going into the classroom, I was doing more than teaching them science, math, social studies. I was, I was a male figure that perhaps some of them uh, looked up to. And what I, and what I find interesting is a lot of my students, even if I didn't have that same mentor mentee relationship, I saw them, you know, start to come in with like button down shirts on or start to cut, you know, maybe pull their pants up a little, you know, a little higher than they used to wear them. And, you know, not to get into cultural aspects of this, but I, you know, but I think when, uh, students go into a job market. Like I mentioned, I, I you know, taught the kid how to tie a tie. I think in a lot of ways, he says to me that helped him, um, you know, when he was, he was navigating the, the different cultures and we talk about code switching, um, you know, it sort of helped them navigate. So I think there's, you know, definitely 
two very valid sides to the to the clothing coin. And I think I think you know even as Kevin and I are dressed now, you know, I'm in a suit. That's sort of my default. And Kevin's a lot more comfortable than I am. That's sort of his default. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm going to ask one really quick rapid fire uh, a question. If each one of you can give the top two things and then we're going to wrap it up as time is running out. But what do you think are the top two challenges? Because we've been talking about the students, the top two challenges facing young men in the Bronx and New York City right now. And um, um, con uh, Council Member Dinowitz, if you don't mind going. <laughs> I know it. I know it's rapid fire, but I'll but I'll just say I, you know I think we see it especially now after COVID. I know you know Councilman Ryan just shared you know a deeply personal but terrible story about one of his former mentees, which is the different avenues our our children have, and sometimes it's it's either you know go into a, a you know a life that is you know not good, that's dangerous, that it's down a bad path, or leave the Bronx. Right. And, and I've heard a lot of teachers, unfortunately, say, you know, don't you want to do better in school so you can get out of the Bronx? And but there's another path. And I think it's the path that you see uh, Assemblymember Burgos, Councilmember Riley and myself taken, which is no stay in the Bronx, stay in the Bronx, work in the Bronx, work towards a better future for the kids and show that there's that third, more important path of doing better for the next generation and doing better uh, for, you know, for our children here in the Bronx and making the Bronx a better place. Thank you. And I know Assemblymember Burgess has to leave uh, very quickly. If you can give the, the top two challenges. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, not super rapid fire, but part of it is definitely could be uh, public safety. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we do have the threat of gun violence and you know, all these avenues are available. Unfortunately, these kids, so we have to make sure they're steered in the right direction. And in part to that answer, I would say exposure. You know, the Bronx is, I think, one of the least exposed boroughs in terms of careers, in terms of prospects, in terms of just opportunities that are out there. Uh, so I think if we can expose a lot of these young men and women to more opportunities, just through exposure alone would have tremendous impacts. And with that, I do have to hop off. Thank you so much for having me here, guys. Thank you very much. And, and Council Member Riley? Uh, thank you, Peter, for that question. I want to say the lack of opportunity, like my colleague, uh, Assemblymember Burgo stated, stated um, the lack of opportunity, workforce development, uh, gun violence, that, that all ties in uh, to the lack of opportunity that our youth have and the inability to express emotion. Um, I think we expressed that earlier uh, when we said that we kind of raising our, um, our young men um, on toughness and to be strong instead of to be loving and caring and, and wanting to give back and being the best that they can be. Um, so I would say those are the two biggest issues. And, and that's a perfect lead in. And, and I would be remiss if as the Dean of Continuing Ed, I didn't mention that Hostos hosts the CUNY Fatherhood Academy, which is for young expectant fathers or, or, or young fathers to help them achieve a high school equivalency diploma, as well as a pathway into the college uh, with a lot of case management and wraparound services around being what a good a uh, family member, a good father, a good young man is, and, and I will invite you all to their graduation in June when we celebrate their, their success. Uh, Pres President uh, Coco de Felipe, is there anything you'd like to uh, close with? It looks like she may be pres president. Anything you'd like to say in closing remarks? Yes, I really want to say that uh, as someone who who is mentored by both men and women, and I have mentored both men and women. I think uh, the, I forgot who said the answer. But the most important thing is that you want to do it, that you care, that you show that you care. And I think that that was you, uh, uh, Councilman Riley, I believe. I, I just want to say that Dinowitz, father and son, are uh, tremendous role models, but that you each are a role model incredibly. Had I had a chance to ask questions when everyone was here, I ask in the council, do you mentor one another? Is there, is there a senior uh, presence that sort of welcomes you and guides you, whether, or, or is that you come in and you learn just quietly the first few months until you feel comfortable? Anybody who can say that, but I just wanted to say above all, thank you and come back, come back again and again, because we do have, we do have programs here. So single 
uh, mothers had a hustle for expectant fathers. There are multiple ways in which the college wants to. And I just cl wanted to also clarify something that was said about uh, uh, men uh, being less represented at Ostos. That's not only at Ostos, that's at every community college throughout the country. And so what we're trying to do at Ostos is create multiple opportunities to have forums such as this one, but also we're going to unveil a number of other activities coming up. The college received the Mackenzie Scott gift and we'll be using uh, some of those funds to support families and multiple activities. And if you're interested in bringing up any ideas as we move forward, we have about eight activities coming up in the spring, which will be sort of piloting, but they're all there, we're open to suggestions for, this, for the following fall and anything where you all feel that you can uh, play a role at the college uh, because it is really, really needed. And right now, just one more thing, the leadership uh, right now in the student government this year here uh, has, has been male. Uh, one graduated in, in January, so there was another election and there's another one was, one was from West Africa. The other one is an African-American male. Uh, many times it's women, but here the student leadership right now, the head, the top leadership, the president and the vice president happen to be men not as young as your average community college uh, student, they're maybe in their late 20s, uh, uh, which is, uh, tells you that they have had uh, 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 work, some of them are displaced workers or immigrants. So thank you. Uh, I, I do hope I get to see both of you at some point. Uh, the well, thank you, thank you, you so and us. share all of that we do, all of you. This is really fabulous and so generous. Much appreciated. Thank, thank you, President. Um, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you all for participating and for joining us. We had as high as 49 participants at one point that stayed with us through most of the program. And I, I think that's important to acknowledge, uh, especially yes. to our president and our panel of distinguished Officials, uh, Assembly Member Jeff Dinowitz, Assembly Member Kenny Burgos, uh, Council Member Kevin Riley, Council Member Eric Dinowitz, and Congressman uh, Bowman. I would especially like to thank the President's Office for their support of today's LADA. Uh, thank you to my and I want to thank you and Eric, Peter and Eric, fabulous, and the support of Diana, my chief of staff, and the team, of Victor, and everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you Thank so much. The work we look, we look forward to uh, staying in touch with you all. The recorded content of today's event will be available on our YouTube page in approximately one week. And thank you all. Have a terrific evening and a good week. And we appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone.